Hopefully, most of you know what this small object is. A simple bicycle bell. Yeah. But what does that sound mean to you, if you really think about it? A memory? A feeling, perhaps? A good one, probably, hopefully. To me, this is the sound of progress, the sound of the future. And it carries me there when I hear it. We hear a lot about that word, progress, don't we? What does it actually mean? Maybe you have a picture in your minds right now, actually. Maybe you're thinking of flying cars or robot servants, or perhaps you're living in a virtual world in your future. You see, when I hear this, I'm in a community that understands some of the best solutions are already here. A community that is not closed off with technology taking up space, but is opened up by it. Where human connections are prioritized. Where the place we live in fundamentally supports and improves our health and happiness well into old age. And isn't that something we all want, actually? Now, to make progress, we have to first deal with the challenges we face now. And many of them are unprecedented. Even in what seems like an idyllic community like this, we know that we are concerned about how to manage the health crisis, how to deal with life's pressures, how to connect with our neighbors, um, bridge the age divide, how to conserve the environment and the economy. It's a long list, actually. And these concerns are quite common to most towns and cities around the world. And it can feel overwhelming, the gap between what we see around us and what we picture in this ideal future. And we wonder, where do we even start to address all this? So what if I told you that there was a 200-year-old invention that many of us already know how to use and have access to that might be the single greatest tool in helping us to create that future? Because what I want to propose today is that the first step in making progress might be as simple as riding a bike. To explain what I mean, I have to first travel back in time. And thankfully, my magic bell also does that, so come with me. OK, it's the 1980s, and uh, this, this little ball of hair is me. Um, I was expecting a few more R's there, but uh, OK, we'll, we'll move on. Anyway, it's my fifth birthday, and I've just been given my first bike. And I'm all dressed up to go to Sherbourne Primary School, which is just a short distance from here. But do you remember that feeling, your first bike? It's like magic, right? Suddenly, the world is opened up and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. There was just one catch. I couldn't really ride the bike outside the garden. The road we lived on was quiet enough. The school was a four or five minute cycle away, but to get there meant crossing another road labeled even today on the maps as only suitable for experienced cyclists. Instead of connecting us, many roads are actually dividing us. So we would throw the bikes in the car and drive off to the woods or go on some family adventure. And as I grew up, I never stopped thinking that cycling was supposed to be some sort of big adventure. And so in my mid-twenties, I went off on a big one. I left here to cycle 4,500 miles across North America. I learned two things on that trip. Well, three, actually, if you include that cycling across a whole continent is quite tough on the backside. I can, I can vouch for that. <laughs> but two important things, should we say. Well, the first is that cycling changes people. Not only was I physically much more healthy after many years of curious illnesses, but my mental health was also much improved. The second is that cycling changes places, and it seemed no coincidence that the places we encountered that had made even a small commitment to cycling were so much more welcoming, the people there just so much happier. And of course, we also found some places that still had a long way to go and needed some help. But I think I wanted to provide that help. And after some years writing about volunteering and campaigning around cycling issues, I moved to Amsterdam three years ago. Now, Amsterdam is known, uh, quite rightly, as the cycling capital of the world. Bikes outnumber people there. But when you arrive in Amsterdam, you don't see a single cyclist, just thousands of people getting about on bikes. No lycra or high vis as if dressed up for battle, just people going to the shops, to school, to work, to meet friends, just getting about. Do you want to see what that looks like, a place that gives itself over in this way to cycling? It's whole car parks and streets given over to be new public parks and playgrounds. And it's neighbors enjoying these quiet spaces and safe areas and talking to each other at a whisper, because the only sound around is this. And this is what I want for all of you. But actually, I think we can go further than that. But why am I telling you this? Why is this so important? Well, not to dwell too much on the numbers, but we should visit them first, because they are quite clear. But can I get a quick show of hands to see how many people cycled here today? 
<laughs> okay. Okay, not a, not a huge number, but certainly not unprecedented. You see, here and across the UK, around 3% of us cycle every day. That's the third lowest level in Europe. If you compare that to the Netherlands, just as a comparison relevant to my experience, and not because it's the ideal, it's 43%. For school children, it's even more remarkable. 3% here compared to as much as 75%. The, the difference is quite remarkable. But those are just numbers. What does that mean in real terms? Well, UNICEF found that Dutch teens are amongst the healthiest and happiest on the planet, with amongst the lowest rates of obesity and antidepressant usage. Coincidence? One of the reasons the numbers here are so low is you've been fundamentally missold. We show a busy mum, for example, a photo of a middle-aged man in Lycra, a gorgeous mammal, if you will. And we say, this could be you. And they say, mm, no thanks. <laughs> or we show commuters quotes like this. And we say, now do you want to cycle? And they say, well, that's nice, but I don't really want to fly like a bird necessarily. I just want to get to work cheaply with a reliable travel time. Thanks very much. They say, well, actually, cycling does that, and it does it much better than all, but they've driven off because we've been doing it all wrong, selling it as an adventure. But crucially, one of the biggest reasons for the low numbers is that no one's been giving you the whole picture. Well, here it is. My colleagues and I at the Social Enterprise, BYCS, have been distilling the best of what we're seeing around the world and have mapped the five transformative impacts of cycling. And it just so happens that they line up pretty neatly against the challenges we know we face here. Well, the first one is not necessarily a big surprise, but it is a big issue, it's health. Lack of physical activity causes one in six deaths in England a year and costs us 7.4 billion pounds in health care and social costs. Let's flip that, because if you cycle regularly, you can reduce your chance of heart disease by 52% and cancer by 40%. It also reduces your risk of type 2 diabetes and obesity. It, reduces, it improves your sleep. It even boosts your sex life, I'm just saying. And it also does remarkable things for mental health, too helping you to manage stress and anxiety, and helping to prevent depression. Hugely significant, given that one in six of us in this room are experiencing mental health challenges right now. Next, we have mobility. And, well, you know that bikes get you from A to B, but crucially, they also get you from A to E, where E stands for education, employment, and essential services like healthcare. Things that many of us take for granted, but are simply out of reach for many millions of people around the world. But thanks to the simplicity and affordability of bicycles, many people, most ages, incomes and abilities, can get the benefits of the bicycle. That goes for the older members of our community too. Because cycling, and this is proven even with electric bike assistance, adds years to life and life to those years. Not just in the traditional health and mobility sense, but also by slowing cognitive decline, by tackling the loneliness crisis. Because cycling brings together all age groups in dynamic, positive ways. Which brings me on to community. Everyone is equal on a bicycle. And by opening up, you involve yourself more with the people around you. We create dynamic, safe communities with more engaged people at their heart. Stronger connections, stronger social bonds. Next, we have the environment. And we know that climate change will affect us all. Even here in this beautiful town surrounded by farmland as it is, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, perhaps the authority on this, their, their advice to us all, we all need to cycle more. And then there's air pollution, a growing crisis, and certainly not a faraway problem. Four in ten children in UK primary schools are breathing toxic air that breaches guidelines from the World Health Organization. Our clean, green bicycles tackle this. Next, we have the economy. Businesses that embrace cycling tend to perform better because they attract the best talent. Those people become more present, creative, and productive. They drive success. Scale that up, and whole towns and cities that embrace cycling also tend to be stronger economically. One study found that those not in cars spend as much as 40% more in neighborhood shops than motorists. But that's just the direct impact. Perhaps most excitingly, cycling also changes the philosophy, the DNA of a place which is helping to inform, inspire, and create a new, sustainable, circular economy. Put all this together, and what do we get? Cycling unlocks massive social, environmental, and e economic benefits for every one of us. I say again, every one. 
If bicycles came in pill form, we'd all have a prescription. And yet no place on earth has so far realized the full potential of what the bicycle can do because they're failing to connect all of these points. Once we do that, everyone can see why we need to get involved. So now you want to know how do we get the benefits here? Well, we've been working on a formula for that too. Many people will tell you that you need to first start with infrastructure and investment. Infrastructure is important, of course. We need bicycle lanes. We need to show that bicycles are taken seriously. We need to make it safer for more people. And this is one of the best ways to increase uptake dramatically. This does require investment, of course, but this is one of the best investments a place can make. Because one pound, euro, or dollar in gets many, many back. If we took the cycling numbers up here from 3% up to 25%, it would yield annual benefits worth 42 billion pounds. Imagine if we got it to 50%. Imagine if we did that around the world. But infrastructure can take time, and there is only so far it will get you. To get things going, we really need leadership. Creative and visionary leadership is so important, and the lack of it so profound in many places around the world, that we established a global non-profit network of leaders for towns and cities around the world that we call bicycle mayors. These bicycle mayors act at the center of their community, bringing everyone together to co-create new solutions for the local context. They bring together people from people on the street to politicians, creating new innovations around the world, from Sydney to Singapore to Sao Paulo, and even in small places like this. Bicycle mayors are showing what is possible. In fact, they're the face of cycling progress, so let me show you one of those faces. In Amsterdam, we also have a junior bicycle mayor, an amazing nine-year-old called Lotta, who is showing that we need to act on the voice of the next generation if we want to be fit for the future. I think we could do with a bicycle mayor here. I think we could do with one everywhere. So leadership is important, but that must be acted on, on behalf, um, alongside the other elements, innovation, inspiration, and activation. But rather than just dryly explain those terms, let me show you how we can do it instead. I want you to imagine yourself in the year 2024. It's five years in the future. We've been able to lead a transformation through cycling here in this community. And we're seeing many of the benefits that I've already outlined. Do you think that's possible? Well, I want to show you how it is possible. So it's time to try and travel again, forward this time, because here's what our future could look like. Well, one of the best ways to start is by making a pledge. So we do that in 2020. We make a high profile public pledge to become a leading center of everyday cycling. We publish our vision for how we're going to achieve this, and it's so inspiring, it gets support of everyone from healthcare, education, politics, the media, the whole community. This leads us to setting up an innovation lab where anyone can come together to co-create new solutions. We then elect the UK's first bicycle mayor and a junior bicycle mayor, and we set up a school leaders network. This carries us into 2021. Businesses start to compete for a prize fund to get their employees on bikes. And this is so successful that these businesses start to reward their employees with extra days holiday to reward them for their good health and productivity. We set up a buddy scheme to enable people to increase their confidence to get to school or work. We receive grants for proficiency lessons for all ages and subsidized e-bikes for older residents and essential workers. This carries us forward into 2022, where the council puts cycling into the heart of every future area development planning. And then we launch a plan for a whole new cycle lane network. In the meantime, quiet routes through town are mapped and signposted. On some roads, signs even advise cars are guests. They must give way to people walking and cycling. We then launch an annual festival to celebrate cycling, as well as a regular series of cultural programs that connect cycling with social change. This carries us on into 2023, the momentum, and we have such a strong local economy that dozens of new enterprises are launched here. Shoppers receive incentives for arriving by bike. Deliveries are done by cargo bikes instead of cars. The media attention for all this means that tourists come here and they come back. In fact, the only annoying thing is you're stuck on waiting lists for every community program you like because they're so popular. We've achieved so much in just a few years, and then it is 2024. A child celebrates their fifth birthday. They get their first bike. And they ask you where they can go. And you tell them, now you can go anywhere. What we build is a healthy, happy, and more prosperous community. And we can do it here. We can do it everywhere. 
You see, that is progress. Human progress powered by bicycles. Because bikes are not toys, they're tools. Cycling is not just transportation, it is transformation. So when you hear this sound, you can be reassured that your community is making progress. And it all starts today with making a collective commitment to just get on our bikes. Thank you.